This morning I want to continue our meditation on the, our confession of faith, looking at the 21st chapter again on uh, uh, religious worship and the Sabbath day, the Lord's day. We're looking at section number four today on the topic of prayer. We began a meditation on the subject of prayer last time. We'll pick up where we left off here in the fourth section, which reads as follows. Prayer is to be made for things lawful and for all sorts of men living, or that shall live hereafter, but not for the dead, nor for those of whom it may be known that they have sinned the sin unto death. We saw last time that prayer is a pivotal part of our Christian worship. Indeed, in many respects, we talk about worship as prayer. We draw near to God, uh, not only in bringing our requests to Him in petitions and praises and thanksgivings, but in our hymns, we often sing prayers to God for His blessings on us. As we receive His Word, we should do so in a prayerful attitude, asking God to help us, enable, enabling us to understand and apply what God's Word has to say. So much of what we do is related to prayer. Prayer brings us into the presence of God, the fellowship with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is not at the heart of Christian worship. And so it is fitting that uh, a good deal of attention is paid in this chapter on Christian worship to prayer. And it is a reminder to us that we need to be diligent in prayer, as we considered last week, even fervent in our prayers, that God would hear and answer our requests and that His kingdom would come. Here we have... Uh, given some guidance as to what we should pray for. And it obviously is not an exhaustive description of what we should be praying for, but there are, uh, especially here, are some fences drawn or, some, or fences uh, posted to keep us from areas that we should not be praying for. Uh, we often think, whatever you want to ask of God, He'll hear and answer it, but there are limits. And we should be very careful to observe those limits. And so, first of all, we should pray for things lawful. Um, and so we should be praying in the light of God's Word and His descriptions for what we should be praying for. That's uh, praying in terms of our worship of God and the advance of His kingdom. How does God want His Word advanced? And, and then prayer about ordinary things of life. We are encouraged to bring our requests to Him but we should pray about things that are lawful uh, in accord with his law. And so uh, be very careful about what you pray for. Um, we are sanctified in our prayers. And the Spirit uh, perfects our minds in the course of our prayers as we bring to mind Scripture. It's always very helpful to have Scripture handy. We're to pray over the Scriptures as we go through our prayer requests. That can stimulate our prayers and guide us as to what we ought to pray for. Pray for things that are lawful. So don't be praying for well, all kinds of things that break the Ten Commandments. Let's put it that way. We should be praying for all sorts of men living. Uh, that gives us a, a wide range of opportunities for prayer. You could sit down and pray for a long, long time just praying about members in our church and then in our broader fellowship that could keep you occupied for quite some time as well as your own prayer requests and for those of your family and loved ones. Uh, pray for all sorts of men living. So pray for the poor and needy. Remember them in your prayers, that God will have compassion on them. Pray for the rich and powerful, that God would lead them in paths of righteousness. Pray for those who are in prison, that God would reveal his gospel to them and give them salvation. Pray for all sorts of people, even your enemies. Pray that God would bless them that God would renew them by His Spirit. Remember the Apostle Paul, who was a great enemy of the church. And it's quite possible that uh, Stephen's prayer, as Paul or Saul was standing beside him, authorizing his uh, murder, his martyrdom, Stephen prayed that God would not hold this against them. And here is one answer to his prayer, that Saul was pardoned for his sins the enemy of the church. So we should pray for our enemies, knowing that God may indeed change them 
and make them great instruments for his work in the world today. Now we're not to pray while we pray for the living. Uh, one more note about those who are living. We should pray as well for those who live hereafter. That is to say, pray for children not yet born and the generations to come. Have you ever considered that as a part of your prayer life? I don't know that I've done much of that. But that is something that we should consider. God works over time to accomplish His purposes. He has a covenant family. And He works through families. And so we should be praying for our children and perhaps our grandchildren who are yet to come. And great-grandchildren. That the seed of the gospel would be planted in their lives as well. That faith would be transferred from one generation to the next. And that the whole family of which we are responsible for, generations to come, may know the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you been given that consideration? We are to be fruitful in God's kingdom. And one of the ways in which that occurs is through our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren, and so forth. As the family expands, God's blessings expand as well. So pray for those who live hereafter. Remember, Jesus himself gave us the example of that in John chapter 17 when he prayed for those who would believe in his name, who would follow the disciples, not just for the disciples, but those who would follow after him. He prayed for us who were not yet even born. So that opens up a whole new avenue for our prayer life. But then there are things that we should not pray for. We should not pray for the dead. Um, the dead have passed from this life and they immediately go to judgment when they pass from this life. Some go to life, some go to death, and for those who have gone to life and the presence of God, there's nothing more we can do for them. They are enjoying so many blessings and joy that far surpass anything that we could imagine that they cannot be helped by our prayers. They have all that they need. By the same token, those who have passed on from this life and have passed in unbelief and rebellion will be sent into hell where they will await the final judgment and there is no prayer that will intercede for them it is appointed to men once to die and after this the judgment then that's it prayer cannot go do anything more for them and so particularly in the uh, Catholic Church where they have not only a heaven and a hell, but also a purgatory where Christian people who, have, who need a little bit of improvement uh, in life, uh, they go to purgatory and spend some period of time there perfecting themselves or being perfected until they are worthy in some form or fashion to enter into heaven. And so the Catholic Church encourages prayers on their behalf. But clearly, Scripture is nowhere encourage us to pray for the dead. Nowhere, nowhere teaches us teach us that there is a purgatory, uh, an in-between state, where people might make it to heaven, or perhaps not, I don't know. But at any rate, we should not be praying for the dead. Or, finally, those of whom it may be known that they have sinned, the sin unto death. Now, that's always a puzzling thing. How do you know when someone has committed the sin that leads to death? And that's hard to say. I think um, there are times when in the message of the gospel, when there is steadfast resistance, we're called to shake off the dust of our feet and move on. And that might be something of a pattern for our prayer life, where there is steadfast resistance to God and His ways and uh, 